back to On The Fly Podcast, a Financial Literacy Institute podcast. Man, you know what, Sean, today, I know we've been hyping this one up so much for good reason. This is an individual I mentioned off camera, has had a lot of influence on not only myself, but also what we do here at FLI. He is an amazing, good-looking, young, hip, innovative guy who is doing a lot on social media, which is amazing. And we're going to, I'm, I'm very curious to ask a lot of questions on like, you know, how he does that, his future plans. This is an individual who's very much just, just absolutely carving away in the financial literacy space in this niche that we're all in, you know, trying to provide this goal to a lot of people who, who need this kind of information. So we appreciate you. Um, but, you know, this is an individual who I have read so much about him. I love his story. I'm so excited to hear more about it. This is something I even believe Sean and I can resonate a lot with. Um, be it, you know, that we are college students and this individual started a lot of the stuff that he did in college as well. So super excited about it. Without further ado, tonight we have Mr. Jeremy from the Personal Finance Club. Oh my goodness. This is someone, again, I've been super excited to have on the podcast. Jeremy, like I mentioned, I know a little bit about you and I'm excited to learn more about you. Sean knows a little bit about you. We've been hyping you up to our community, to our you know, to our, to our followers, to our listeners. And this is something that I've been super much, super much, not even work, very much looking forward to having, uh, having you on the podcast. Today. Can you kind of tell us a little more about who you are, what you do, what personal finance club is, you know, we can talk all about that and then we can kind of get into it from there. Cool. Thanks, dude. Uh, and thanks yeah. for describing me as young. That happens less and you less are. these days. Yeah, I agree. I'm young. Um, yeah, Absolutely. I'm Jeremy Schneider. Um, I guess my quick background in my story is I started a company in college. Uh, I turned down a job offer from Microsoft and said, decided to start my own company. I had no idea what I was doing, but through blind, uh, blind persistence over the course of 10 or 11 years, I grew that company and eventually sold it when I was 34 for over $5 million. I quit my job when I was 36 and then I was like kind of a young retiree. I did nothing for a year. I played video games and traveled like I thought you were supposed to. And then I found out that that was kind of got boring. And then I decided to follow what my passion is, which for some people would be something much cooler, like, I don't know, skydiving or wake surfing or something. But I really like uh, personal finance, helping people learn about money, investing and that kind of stuff. And so I started Personal Finance Club, which is basically what I do now. I help people learn about personal finance and investing. Most of the magic happens on Instagram where we make these little digestible bite-sized infographics daily and yeah that's what i do now i help people with personal finance yeah no absolutely and like i mentioned the, the stuff that you do has influenced me um and a lot of things that we even do at fli had a lot of inspiration on amazing individuals like yourself right so i guess one of the first place i want to start because like i mentioned is that you had a lot of this drive this ambition entrepreneurial um, you know, uh, aura about you in college, right? And this is something like I mentioned uh, to Sean is that, and he, even though as well as Zach is that we're still in that, you know, young phase and I'm even still in college. Again, I mentioned to you off camera that I graduate in a month. Super excited about that. Our, our, our listeners know that. So, you know, can you kind of talk about, I want to start back in the college days, right? Who was Jeremy? What was he like? You know, because you hear all those entrepreneur uh, you know, stories about, oh, I never really liked school. I spent a lot of my time on my business, school, forget this, right? And your story may or may not be like that. Again, Todd Baldwin, that was his story, super funny. Uh, Robert Frank, that was his story. And I'm curious, you know, was your story similar? Were you able to juggle all these things? Um, what, who was Jeremy back in college? I want to know more about your uh, college entrepreneur journey. Um, I was a good student, but not an incredible student. I went to the University of Michigan, your neighbors to the north. Um, I studied computer science. Um, you know, I was smart. I got good, but not incredible grades. I think my GPA when I graduated was 3.6 or 3.7 or something. So it was, it was good, but not like 4.0 or anything. Um, and I, I guess I never really saw myself as an entrepreneur. I didn't think I would be starting a company. Um, I didn't see myself as like having the, I don't know, charisma or like this is not the not the like leader kind of guy i saw myself as like the smart kind of like second or third guy maybe and so as i was graduating i was actually looking for a job at a small company and i had i would interviewed or i interned at microsoft for two summers and so i had worked for like you know the biggest of companies and they offered me a full-time job um and i turned it down and i just i was actually dating someone who was had another year of college left and i 
didn't really want to work for a big company and I maybe would have like under different circumstances gone and joined like the Peace Corps or traveled or something, but I wanted to stay in my college town for that reason. So I just decided that and I couldn't find a job at a small company. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, I guess I'll just try to start my own. That was literally the, the, the reason. And I, I, like, you know, I guess I said to kind of give confidence to some people who think that everyone who starts a company has this like massive passion that, and, and vision that like, from day one, they know they're going to succeed. And, and I, I don't think that was the case for me. It's more like I backed into it. But then to my credit, I think I did, I was very stubborn and didn't give up for a long time, which I think was the real secret sauce to eventual success. So the company that you started out of college, can you provide a little bit of background for our listeners on that? Yeah. Uh, the early days, I was literally just trying to get people to give me money so I could take it to the grocery store and buy food with it so I would not starve to death. Uh, that was the that was the big vision back then, um, and at one point that took the the um, the shape of me emailing my. Well, I noticed that my old landlord had this website that was like god awful. Like go to their website, <laughs> and they had, they had like a hundred different properties, like college town properties they rented out, and their website they had like opened up a word document, like typed like just stream of consciousness, typed a hundred different property descriptions into this thing with like. A couple had like a photo or two, most didn't, no sort, like no order, no ability to sort or anything. Um, and then they just clicked save as web page and then uploaded it somehow. <laughs> that, that was their entire website. And there's like, they're like a big property management company. And so I knew how to like build a website. So I took like three days and basically worked like all day, three days in a row to build them a new website from scratch where you could, you know, it looked nicer. You could search and sort and, you know, filter by number of bedrooms and location and things like that. And then I, uh, I emailed it to them and heard nothing back. And I was like, oh, and they didn't like, they kind of might've known who I was. Like they had, you know, hundreds of tenants any given year and with tons of turnover because it was a college town. So I was really nobody to them. And I was like, oh man, I spent three days on this. I was making no money. So I figured, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal to waste three days, but still it was felt like a big waste to put all that work into it. So I was like, I should call them on the phone, which I was terrified to do. Um, but I picked up the phone, called him. I said, hey, my name's Jeremy. I'm a former tenant. I sent you a new website I made for you. Did you happen to see it? They said no. And I was like, oh, like, can I send it to you again? And they're like, sure. And so then I emailed, to again, e emailed to him again. And then I was watching. It was like hosted on a like desktop computer in my living room. I was watching like how many people were connecting to it through some little dashboard. And there's, of course, zero because no one was aware of it. But then after I sent it, like a couple minutes later, sure enough, someone connected for like, you know, 30 seconds. And then it went back to zero. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I got one, one, one click. Um, and I thought maybe that was it, but then the phone rang again and he's like, he's like, yeah, we'll buy it. And he's like, how much is it? I was like, oh, I did not think the sales process was going to go that fast. I didn't even think of a price yet. I literally just made this for free. Um, and so I made up a price off the top of my head. I think I charged, I think I said it was $3,000 and like $300 a month or something, which is an outrageously high monthly fee. I don't know what inspired me to say something so big. And he said, how about $2,000 up front, but the monthly fee is fine. And I was like, great. Um, you know, I was trying to play it cool. Like I'd been there before. Um, and so yeah. that didn't answer your question. That's a different question, but what basically what that became was, um, we started making more websites for landlords and we eventually found this common need among landlords where they wanted to basically post their properties to multiple websites on the internet. So they wanted to post to like Zillow and Craigslist and apartments.com and rentals.com and all these different apartment search websites that were like kind of prop cropping up at the time. And so we built what we call like a rental housing syndicator where you could post once and automatically be on 50 different sites. We renamed the company to rent links, which kind of better described what we did. Um, and then that's what we did for the next, you know, eight years or whatever. Yeah. Well, in, uh, so many gems you just dropped right there, but it's so interesting because again, we just talked about private, like previously off camera that for me now, you know, transitioning to this next season of my life, graduating and, you know, moving out to a different state for a big company. Right. I was just telling you how I'm doing some apartment hunting. Right. And it's funny you're saying all this because that website I was looking at could have used your help. <laughs> Not going to lie. Uh, so that's, that's amazing that you said that. And, you know, clearly you had uh, some of that, that, that spontaneity, that, that, that spunk in you that you were able to just come off with a number off rip and then work from there. And then obviously you saw some more need in that. And I'm still seeing that to this day, uh, which is funny. So, no, I love that a lot. I love that a lot. And so, you know, can you kind of talk about 
I think you drove a little bit of what your why was, and it might have been, you know, uh, food, housing, just just living, right? Which is fair. That's that's a driver. Um, maybe more of like as well. I'd love to know more about your background behind personal finance because you know, learning a little bit about you, um, your you got into investments a little bit early from your parents, right? And so I would love to know like how like what was your so I guess I'm even going back a little bit further. What was your childhood like in terms of maybe your parents under, um, you know, giving that financial literacy information? Because that's something we also talk about a lot on this podcast. And what we talk a lot about with FLI is that you don't just want to transfer the physical assets, to, uh, you know, on and kind of carry that legacy. But also it's more importantly that knowledge. Right. So so clearly that happened with you. And I can only imagine that's going to continue to happen as your as your legacy continues. Right. So we can kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, because I think that'd be very interesting uh, to know a little more about. Yeah. You know. If you'd asked me as a child or even as a, someone in my 20s, I wouldn't have listed, you know, personal finance or investing as one of my, um, you know, main strong suits necessarily. Um, but yeah. now that I know more about the world, I think that I did have a pretty early introduction to it. And so, you know, as a, as a small child, my parents were very frugal. And so I definitely had a very frugal, uh, you know, role models growing up like we were very tight with money my parents did not have much money when they got married and they started like earning better throughout their careers but we're always very tight with money and we we're always spending less we made and saving and not being flashy with our money or you know and i think some children have a different experience where they are taught fancy cars are wealth and spending is wealth and you want to look like you have wealth and we are more like hey we want to save our money and not spend it all um and so i had that experience and then as a 17 year old, I believe I had my first paid job at a summer camp. And um, my dad very cleverly knew that the the rule of a Roth IRA is such that you can't contribute more than this year, $6,500 per year, but you also can't contribute more than your earned income. And so if you have no income, you can't contribute more than zero. And so when <laughs> I, I think I made $12,000 or something, you know, sorry, $1,200. <laughs> $1,200. I was like, no, that's too much. Yeah, I made $1,200. And my dad very kindly gifted me. He basically matched me 100% and said, okay, you can keep your $1,200 you earn. I'm going to gift you $1,200 and you and will contribute it to your Roth IRA. So like, like according to the IRS law of the land, <clears throat> when I was, and I think it might have, I might have turned 18 at some point uh, in there. And so when I was 18, 100% of my income that year was contributed to a Roth IRA. And then he's like, okay, so we opened up an account. It's called a Roth IRA. You need to pick your mutual funds inside. So we, he kind of like walked me through picking mutual funds. That's not exactly how I invest in more, but it's still close enough. And I was like, okay, cool. And so then, you know, 15 years go by and now I'm like in my early thirties and I'm talking to my friends who are my age. And I was like, I was like, yeah, it's like, what, uh, what mutual funds do you guys have in your Roth IRA? And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, there's this like, like no one's home. I was like, I was like, Oh, you guys didn't do that when you were 17. Like I did. Um, and so I definitely like had that, you know, role model and experience growing up. And, and then the, a lot of learning came after I sold my company when I was like, okay, I'm a smart guy, but a lot of smart people go broke. So I have, I sold my company for $5 million. My share after taxes was $2 million, which is a ton of money for sure. But it's also not like, you're not like buying private jets and, you know, just burning money. You know, you can go broke very easily with $2 million. So I started reading all the books on money and I was like, oh, all these books say the exact same thing. This isn't, you know, that what we hear in pop culture and media and is not, is not really the true path to building wealth. Um, and so that's what I kind of developed more of a passion for like spreading that word so that more people can learn how to build wealth. So, and from the point where you're at right now, having sold your company, running Personal Finance Club, what does your current asset like allocation in terms of investments look like? Are you only in the stocks? Do you dabble into real estate too? You own a business. What's how do you spread that around to not only provide protection but also try to maximize growth? Yeah, so my that two million dollars I end up with after I sold my company has grown to about four point five million today, which makes sense because it was eight years ago, and money in the market doubles every seven years or so. So I'm kind of like on pace for having invested, um, and most of that growth, like almost all of it, has come from investing. Um, you know, I did work for the company that acquired me for two years, and I was making like one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and lived below that, so a little bit was my income. 
And a, a little bit I've made from like personal finance club as a business, but not much. I basically donate or pay salaries to my employees, all that money. Um, and so my current asset allocation is um, mostly in index funds, about uh, 3 million of the 4.5 is in index funds, more or less. Um, about 1 million or so is in the house that you guys can see behind me, but maybe your listeners can't. It's a two bedroom condo in San Diego. It's currently, you know, valued at 1.1 million or so. Um, and then the rest is in other, and you know, maybe about 30,000 is in cash. Like if you look in my checking account, there's 30,000 bucks or so. And then the rest, I think we have like maybe three or $400,000 left, whatever is left is in some real estate or other stuff. Um, I, I personally invest in things that meet the following criteria. They provide income while you own it. And it's likely to go up in value. If you buy things and hold them that meet over time, you will become wealthy because just as just for holding it and letting time go by, you're going to get income. You can use that income to buy more to get that compound growth effect. And then they're likely to go up in value. And so the two major asset classes that meet that criteria are equities like stocks and bonds and real estate. Um, physical real estate, like buying a rental property and putting renters in there and renting out is just a lot of work. And I think my personal skill set is better suited towards like building digital things like technology. And so I don't do a lot of physical real estate, even though I think it's a great option for many people. And if I was 22 and had 10,000 bucks to my name and a lot of hustle, like maybe that's exactly what I'd be doing. Um, but for me, it's not. So that's where, that's why most of my money is in index funds. Um, but yeah, I keep very little in cash and just keep most of my money growing. No, thank you a lot for sharing that. And I think that's very insightful as we are those 22, 23, 24 year olds that are, you know, going hard in the paint and what we're doing, you know, in our season of life. So it's, it's very funny you say that. So, you know, uh, you mentioned it a little bit where post selling your company, right? You had a lot of this cash, which is amazing. But then you were like, hmm, I'm a, I'm a smart individual, but smart individuals do go broke. You mentioned that, which is true. So what did you do? You gained knowledge, whether it's through books, mentors, podcasts, YouTube videos, you gain knowledge because you knew you didn't want to be one of those statistics where you gain money and you lose it just as fast. Right. So I would love to know, um, a little, a little bit after that, right. Because I love telling the story about even personal as well as FLI. We, uh, you know, Sean, myself, Zach, all got to a point where we were good with the finances. But then we felt like it would be a disservice if we did not share that information to friends and family, especially, you know, friends with credit card debt or, or friends who aren't investing or family, you know, a family who have, you know, just all these kinds of things. We wanted to have some sort of credibility uh, to be able to make this information that we're giving stick. Right. So I'm curious. You gained all this information. What was that transition from starting to build Personal Finance Club? Um, you know, why even call it personal finance club? I want to know all these kinds of things as well as, you know, what was like the first year, like your, your, I guess this was your, maybe perhaps from what we, from what I know, your second entrepreneurial journey, right? Was it, was it rough? Was it hard? Were you doubting yourself? Uh, again, you've been through something like this already with rent links, but what was it like transitioning more into the personal finance space? Yeah. So it's kind of been a passion of mine for a long time. And, and I said, you know, there's been a, it's been a progression from that 17 year old picking mutual funds to the 36 year old retiring early um, with multi millions or whatever. But um, you know, in my thirties, like I said, I was talking to my friends and said, what mutual funds did you have? And they said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I was like, we should sit down and fix that. Like you need a Roth IRA. You need to be like investing this money. And so um, we were, I literally like, a bunch of my friends here in San Diego, we would like just set up a time and like drink a beer and like open up a Roth IRA. And, you know, I would walk through it with them. And I, I think one of them like jokingly started calling it personal finance club. They're like, like, Oh, can you come over again? And we'll have personal finance club, like as a joke where we just drink beers and set it up. And it, it like just was like a very friendly sounding name to me. And so that was like really the birth of personal finance club, like many years before it officially started online or whatever. And then when I did start it, I was like, uh, you know, thinking of different names and I was considering like grasshopper finance with some sort of like grasshopper and ant uh, like message or grasshoppers, like also could be like a mentee or something like that. Um, but then I just kept coming back to personal finance club, but it was, the domain was taken personal And I figured I needed the domain if I was going to get the website, but, or 
get use the brand, but it was for sale. And I think they want $800, which seems like an outrageous amount to spend for like this hobby of mine. Um, but I eventually was like, all right, Jeremy, you're rich, you can afford it. And I offered him 500 and they said yes or something like that. So I ended up <laughs> buying the domain. Um, and yeah, that's why it's called personal finance club. And then, um, it be, kind of became more of like a real thing when I was talking to an ex-girlfriend of mine and she's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like you quit your job and in like a good way, she wasn't trying to be negative or anything. And I was like, I would love to like do this, like helping of, with money that I've been doing like on a broader scale, either like a podcast or a show or something like that. Um, and so then she's like, that's not crazy. I was like, you're right. That's not crazy. So that's when I started. It was in 2019. I was like, all right, I'm going to start. Uh, and I think social media is a good place to start because it's like, we're, if everyone read three books on personal finance, I would just close up shop and be done because they would know everything that I have to teach essentially. <laughs> um, but they're not, they're on social media. And so I was like, that's where I'll go. And so I opened up, I started an Instagram account, call it personal finance club. And I set a goal of getting to 50,000 followers in a year. I was like, I was like, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a smart guy, right? I can figure out how to do Instagram, even though I basically, you know, I had like a very small personal account and I'd posted a few pictures too. That was basically my whole Instagram experience. And then, yeah, I started posting. And then for the first year and a half or more, there was no, it wasn't a company. It was just Jeremy's hobby, passion project, trying to get followers just for fun. So I have something to do with my time. And then uh, it was actually 2020, kind of late summer bored during the pandemic. Now I had gotten a lot of followers. I think I had like 80,000 followers at that point. And they're asking me the same questions over and over and over. And I was like, man, I should really put together a series of videos so that when people ask me these questions, it can be like a brain dump A through Z. Here's how it works. Here's what a stock is. Here's what a bond is. Here's what a mutual fund is. Here's what an index fund is. Here's what a Roth IRA is. All this stuff to like, and connect all these pieces that people hear about. And so I made those videos and I was like, I'll just give it away for free. And then I was like, well, if you give it away for free, no one's going to finish it. No one's going to value it. Also, I've been, I spent spending money on, I spent like money on the domain and the website. I was going to FinCon, like these conferences, spending money on all these, all this different stuff. And then I was like, yeah, if I charge something a little for it, then I can maybe like cover my expenses. And maybe if we make more, I can even hire someone to help make more content. And then, so I put on sale for 50 bucks and I kind of did like a one week sale. And in that week, uh, I sold over a hundred thousand dollars and I was like, oh, that's a lot of money. I think I might've just started a business by mistake. And so, yeah, now, now I have two full-time employees, California based, and we're, uh, we're still, we're growing, we're making more content. And, and based on that too, the million dollar question that I have is what strategies did you put in place to ramp your social media profile up from nothing to 50,000 and 80,000 and what you're almost at 500,000 followers now? Yeah. On Instagram, we're at, yeah, close to 500 for, 80 something, or I think, um, you know, I think everyone, that is the million dollar question because everyone asks and my answer is really boring, which is, and it's like the answer that it's like, if you see someone who's just shredded and they're just jacked, they're like super ripped and incredible shape and super fit or whatever. And you're like, what's the secret? The answer they're going to give you is really boring. They're going to say, guess what? I eat healthy every day. I work out every day. <laughs> It's diet and exercise. And the more fit you want to be, the more, more of it you got to do. And, and the answer is the same for social media. It's not like, it's not like I figured out the secret hashtag that, that if, once you know it, you go, you go viral. It's like <laughs> you post a lot and you post really good content. And you know, there's like, there's some best practices. Like if you post stuff that no one cares about, it's not going to do well. So you want to post what I call like punchy and shareable content. If you post like walls of text with little tiny words that's like boring and doesn't apply to anyone it's not going to be very popular but if you post things that are like relatable tell a story connect with people it's providing value it's like i don't act like we still rarely ask for anything like we don't say hey go follow us here go do this go do that we just here's value here's a tip here's here's a secret here's here's a skill like just give 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 make it punchy, make it shareable, make it what's in it for them, not what's in it for me. And just consistently do that and iterate and, and respond to what works better and keep trying to figure out what works better and better. It's just that over time. And any one post of ours, you know, isn't that interesting, but just, and so people who, 
check in with me rarely they're like oh bro you blew up overnight i'm like no it was like one post at a time grinding for four years like getting 200 followers at a time is how i got to 500,000. not like just like going viral one day and getting lucky so that's my answer it's just a, it's a diet and exercise of of uh social media no you know absolutely and something that it's funny sean asking because i was going to ask a similar question now there's some sub questions onto that and i think it's really really good for us to go go down so you know i think now maybe and maybe you did this back in the day um but there's a social aspect to you right where you say you know i'm this young and i've amassed this much right and that's like oh instant social proof clearly he's got it right and i think that's very interesting because some like people like us right our demographic is also early kind of early professionals uh early career professionals just like ourselves but at the moment we're also on the same playing ground we just have the knowledge Right. So it's very interesting where that social proof comes in place. Like, oh, well, Jeremy knows what he's doing. Let's go tap into him because clearly he's got. But then obviously your content is amazing. It's fire. Right. So that, that definitely makes sense. Um, so I just want to make that point. So, you know, my question and you kind of talked about it very briefly was, um, you know, from our social media or, you know, and when I say from our, I'm talking about your uh, personal finance club. You said we don't really make that much or not even that we don't push towards this from how whatever you can share right and I, you know i was viewing the website and i have a question about the a cool funny question about the merch later how does you know personal finance club make money is that and maybe did it start did it shift did it start one way shift another way like maybe it started with like coaching and then it maybe went to like ads and then now partnerships well, however what was the process with that and then now where is it at and potential question later down the future or later down the line would be you know what is the future goal with it yeah. So first to like the social proof thing, you know, I, like in my Instagram bio, the first thing it says is retired at 36. Um, and I, you know, I obviously put that to catch people's intention, but I promise you, like, that has very little to do with, <laughs> with the success. Like if I put that and rate shitty content, I'd have no <laughs> followers. And if I had a boring bio and had fire content, I'd probably have about the same, um, you know, so like for sure, I think about what goes in that bio because when someone looks at your profile, they get like three seconds to make a decision about if they want to follow you. But I'd say every, you know, so I think some people look at other popular people and they say, oh, I couldn't do it because I was, didn't retire at 36 or I'm not a uh, kickboxing international champion or I'm not, you know, but the thing is like everyone has an angle, you know, like you could be like, I'm a stay at home mom who knows how to save or something like that. Or I'm a... I'm a 22 year old living like a baller. I, I don't know, like, you know, every, you know, there's always something that, that an angle that you can bring that people identify with. And like lots of people don't identify with me. You know, I think it's perfectly reasonable to be like, oh, look, a six foot four rich white guy who's mansplaining money to me. Like, it's not a very, uh, you know, relatable position. And I like, I, I, that just, you know, I don't like really position myself that way, but I can understand how someone might see me that way. So I think another person might be more relatable in, in different regards. So yeah, so I wouldn't like, you know, if you're someone who's thinking about growing social media, don't discount what you can bring from, you know, from your perspective. Um, that said, what was the second half of that question? Oh yeah, how do we make money? So there's like a few ways to make money on social media. We lost, uh, we lost Inca. Or Inca, should we wait for him? Yeah, you're good, keep going. Okay. There's, there's a few ways to make money on social media. I think largely people do sponsored posts where they like will post something that a brand wants them to, or they can do affiliate posts where they post something where if you click the link and they sign up, you get paid, or you can create content for every other brands. Like you can probably see people like making ads for other brands. Um, there's several other ways. And we basically do none of that. We've never done a sponsored or we've done, we did one sponsored post as like kind of an experiment publicly but we don't do sponsored posts we don't do affiliate links we've never we've never done anything the only thing we do to make money is basically sell this like one and now two digital courses that our average sale is about 60 bucks now and 99 percent of our money has just come from selling those digital courses the remaining one percent is just you know some random stuff like a speaking gig here or there or um i think instagram and and tiktok pay us some money for ads occasionally but it's like a few hundred bucks um so basically all of it is just uh just the the course sales and nothing else okay so do you feel that doing doing ads and um affiliate links do you think that that kind of can water down content and make it seem like although your post may be the goal of the post maybe to provide value that it feels almost salesy or almost pushy in that aspect i think it does from me i think that a consumer generally expects 
there to be ads like if you're watching a tv show you know when mr beast is doing a a youtube video and stops in the middle to push his brand like you're like of course he does because that's how he makes money and that's great you know for us like i think instagram is more of like a like a like a like follow friends type platform instead of youtube which is more like a publication platform so i feel like maybe ads are a little bit less welcome there um but from my perspective i just don't like pushing someone else's agenda because it doesn't feel good to me also i just think it represents a conflict of interest if we if some insurance company sponsored us and said hey you know for every time someone signs up for this insurance policy we're going to give you 20 percent of the, the first year's commission or whatever um i would probably let my mind bend the world as I see it into thinking that would be a good product. Um, and I have this conflict of interest now, right? And so we just kind of drew a line in the sand and said, you know, and luckily and thankfully, because I have the financial means to not have to do any sponsorships, um, I was like, I was like, we never do it. And literally every single day we get emails, people want to sponsor, like most of them are from crappy, you know, companies or agencies you've never heard of or anything. It's not like Vanguard is begging us or anything, but um you know we get we get offers every day and just it's just so easy to to just ignore them or if they're really pushy we just be like we don't do brand deals so good luck um but that said like there are other influencers who i like and respect who that's a big part of their business and and their followers and their customers love what they do and um you know so i'm sure we could and that would probably be fine yeah absolutely no and you see um a question now that, that has come up on my side would be, you know, you just, and I love asking people who are in our niche this question come on the podcast, because again, like I mentioned um, at the beginning of the call, that this is the kind of information that is way more important than the asset itself. So the first kind of preliminary question is, uh, Jeremy, do you have kids or plan to have kids? Sorry about that. Got you on a drink. I was coughing. Already. Yes. I would say that. Am I going to have kids? Yeah, do you have kids or do you plan to have kids? Never married, no kids. Um, but maybe one of these days, if I can trick a girl into marrying me, I think I would <laughs> probably like to have kids. But I'm also getting to the age where got to be realistic that maybe it's on the cards, but who knows? Okay. So, so kind of secondary question now, if you were to go with the plan of having kids, right? Um, how would you set them up, you know, financially with knowledge, but also too with like with um, the asset of, uh, like because we love talking about obviously the UTMA, the UGMA, the 529 custodial. Like there's just there's so many. Uh, but how would you, as a father, go um, go around that 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 uh, passing that knowledge to kids? Yeah, you know, I get questions a lot about how do I set up my kids. Like how do I, you know, invest in my kids or grow wealth for my kids? And I think that the most important thing you can give your kids is really a good example and good information. And you know, and and I can, I think I get that question a lot from people who had bad financial role, role models growing up themselves are struggling with money. They're struggling to get out of debt. They're struggling to build wealth, et cetera. And then they want to like give their kids a head start. So like their heart is in the right place, but kind of funny, like my heart or my head is in the opposite position, which is, I don't want to like spoil my kids. I want to just like give them a trust fund or whatever and have them be pieces of shit who like, don't know how to like. Can I, I know you guys are in college. I'm allowed to swear. You can bleep that if you need to. Um, uh, who don't know how to like the value of hard work. And and not only because I think that would make them bad people, although maybe it would. Also, I think that they would get less out of life if they just had cash handed to them and didn't respect the work and didn't have the, you know, the benefit of feeling productive and their own growth and their own journey right um and you know i think that's a really important part of life and so so while people who are struggling want to give their kids a head start which is great like i'm doing well i'd want to make sure my kids are appropriately prepared to forge their own journey and not just piling cash on their plate without context for it you know um and so I, I think, yeah, I think education is the best in teaching them about, hey, this is why we spend less than we make. This is why we avoid debt. This is why we don't buy flashy things just to look like we're rich. This is, um, you know, this is what real wealth looks like. This is how real wealth behaves. This is how hard work translates to success over time. Um, you know, those are the types of lessons that I think that are, are the most important for kids, even if they don't have 
you know, a Roth IRA hundred percent match when they're 17, like I got or whatever. Um, you know, that, that $1,200, I'm 42 now, $1,200 is now worth like, I don't know, six or $8,000 something, which is nice. You know, like it grew, it doubled a few times or whatever it did, but like that, that's not going to change my life, you know, but the lesson I think changed my life. So maybe if you open a Roth IRA for kids and you put 20 bucks in there, you know, they won't have an $8,000 head start at 42, but they'll have the knowledge to start doing it themselves and, and build that wealth for themselves. But to your point, when, when with what you said about if a parent or um, parents are not well set up financially, but they want to do the same for their kids, it's almost like the airplane oxygen mask kind of method. You want to take care of yourself before you take care of, you know, your kids or those next to you. So I feel like, you know, yes, it's in the, a good place for wanting to take care of your kids and set up your kids. But if you're not in a good financial position yourself, I think you're not only doing your kids a disservice, but you're also doing yourself a disservice. Would you agree? Yeah. Did you get that air oxygen mask metaphor from me? Cause I definitely have a post about that or maybe we both came up with independently. I don't know, but yeah, it's exactly right. Cause like on an, on an airplane, they teach you to put your own mask on first, because if you try to help your kids, then you pass out and you both die. And the same is true financially, right? Like if you're swimming in debt and then you're trying to like make an investment account for your kid, you're just, you know, you're just, randomly giving your kid money when you what you should be doing is setting yourself up and you can always gift money to your children down the road like if you're investing for yourself like one of the best ways to invest for your kids is just to invest for yourself with a plan to give them money because it has ultimate flexibility here's a little here's a little um trivia question for you guys and and people are always afraid of anything in the world of tax anything in the world of estate planning estate tax gift tax and so here's the trivia question if you are married and you and your spouse die, how much can you gift to your children either before you die or after your death, like before you die in terms of gift tax or before, after your death in an estate tax, how much can you gift to your children with 0% tax before they start implementing the gift slash estate tax? So do you have this set up in a trust or not? No trust, just it's in your checking account, just straight through how much can you gift to your, your uh, your kids before after that before so there's a certain number where it's called the the estate tax exemption where up until that amount it's 100 percent tax free so if you gift your kids 100 bucks for their birthday you're not filing down your taxes for example and you have to um you know pay you know pay some tax on it so the question is what is like the lifetime uh gift exemption so I want to say it's like in the $9 million range. Does that sound right? Because didn't they just change this a couple of years ago from a larger amount down to a lower amount? That's a really good guess. Inka, do you have a guess? I'm going to throw one out there and I'm going to say it's a trick question. I'm going to say zero. Okay. Another good guess. Uh, Sean, that's actually the closest answer I've ever heard. It's actually about $12 million per mm -hmm. person. So for a married couple, the answer would be $24 million. And so you can actually gift... And this is a lifetime exemption. So over the course of your lifetime, which is still a lot of money, you can give $24 million, 100% tax-free to your children or to anyone before the gift tax takes place, um, which is bananas, right? And so <laughs> I think I think people are like trying to like, ooh, I just got like, you know, behind closed doors, shuffle some money into my kids' accounts. Like, no, you don't. You can just write them a check for a million dollars later if you want to. And whether it's growing, you know, and you mentioned like, 529, UGMA, UTMA, like custodial Roth IRA. There's, there's like, there's like marginal benefits, all those accounts, but they also come with restrictions and they come with uh, catches. And so the, the, you know, the auction mask is for sure. Like, Hey, pay off your own debt. Make sure you're on pace, pace for healthy retirement. Make sure you're not going to be a burden to your children, grow wealth <laughs> for yourself. And if you really yeah. want to help your kids do all that while setting a great example, and you still have that in your back pocket, 24 million tax free, you can write. And if it just, and if, if you're alone, like I am, you can just 12 million, still a lot of money. And, and along those lines too, isn't there a yearly restriction like per person? Isn't it like 16,000 per year that you can give away out, out exactly. of that 20? So exactly right. And people confuse these two numbers. It's one of the most confused tax rules. And so the 20 or the 12 million per person is a lifetime exemption. That means you can like, they're counting. So if you give away a million dollars a year for 12 years, at the end of that 12 years, you'll have reached that $12 million lifetime exemption. And then after that, gifts will incur the gift tax. There's also a yearly gift tax exemption, 
Below that, there's no gift tax. And below that, you don't even have to count it towards the lifetime number. And so that's the $16,000 number. And so that means if you give your kids 16,000 bucks a year for 10 years, it'll be 160,000 and you'll be at zero towards the 12 million still. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people will conflate those two and they're like, oh, if I give away 20,000, I'm gonna you know, pay tax. No, if you don't pay tax, you just have to, you also have to fill, file a form saying you've given a large amount of money. And so like, you know, it's just a reasonable number saying you can, you can give your kids a thousand bucks for college, like spending money and you're not gonna pay tax on that, you know, like, and you're not gonna even have to keep track of it or put in your taxes or anything like that. Um, but yeah, over the 16,000, that's when it starts accruing towards that $12 million lifetime exemption. So realistically, you could give more than $24 million over a lifetime. If you start giving a kid money when they turn one year old and you yeah. do it for 40 or 50 years, you could, you could potentially add a couple million to that. Yeah. I mean, but you know, that ain't your problem, right? Like if, you, if you're, yeah. if you're going to give away 50 million and 26 of it might be subject to some tax and you want 22 of it to be subject to tax, like your kid's going to have many millions of dollars, you know, like I feel like when, when we get in those types of those types of discussions, I just like to remind people, like, I don't care about that problem. Like if you're giving your kid 24 million and tax free and your problem is you want to minimize the tax above 24 million, I just don't care. In fact, like <laughs> I would be fine with hundred percent estate tax over that and just be like, you know what? your kids will get 24 million and the kids who go to the shitty public schools that whose teachers are like having to bring bulletproof jackets to <laughs> school, they're going to get the rest so they can, you know, buy some books for something. You're like, like politically speaking, I'd be fine with that. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love this. And this, again, this is very much as, as our FLI community knows, I'm very much the budgeting investing credit card guy, right? Sean's big in tech and I consistently learn from Sean and I'm learning gems just like that from you, Jeremy. So I appreciate that. And I know our, our audience listens and they appreciate that as well. So, you know, as we wrap up here, I just have a couple more questions. So, you know, you mentioned, and I read this about you, that you were a gamer, right? Which I love. I know we have a lot of gamers in our community, which is awesome, right? And I, I love bringing the parallel of like video games and like finance. Cause for me, like finance, personal finance, it's like a game where your net worth is kind of like that experience point to a degree, it's your number you're trying to get as high as possible, like similar to like Pop Tropica, maybe you're trying to, you know, uh, have a certain network or maybe get a degree over here, get a side hustle over here, build a business over here, get a you know full-time job over there, right? Um, can you kind of talk about, you know, how you trend? Cause you said maybe you don't play video games as much anymore. Um, maybe that got boring after you, uh, after you, um, after you transitioned into into what you're doing now right so can you kind of talk about is there any parallels between video games and the game of life so i would i would distinctly say that i'm not a gamer i i played a game for like okay. one summer in college and then i was like man that was a gigantic waste of time so i quit <laughs> cold turkey and then like didn't play any like you know any serious i still play like wordle and stuff but i didn't play any like serious okay. video games until i was 36 and i sold my company and i was bored and i was like you know what i'm gonna install starcraft i'm gonna play a video yes, game StarCraft. And then I got super addicted for like a year and I just like, <laughs> I kind of have a little bit of an addictive obsessive, obsessive personality. And so I played it for a year. And then after that year, I was like, man, that was a big waste of time. And so I, I uninstalled the cold Turkey and haven't played since. Um, and so I wouldn't describe myself as a gamer, but I do like the, the analogy because I think a lot of people have a lot of shame around money. You know, they're like, I literally had someone once message me and they're like, Jeremy, like, I'm so late. Can I, is it too late for me to invest? Like, I know that I'm like so far behind and I feel so much shame around this. I was like, I was like, how old are you? And, and they're like 23. And I know you're about that age, but from a 42 year old's perspective, I wanted to like reach through my phone and grab them around the neck and <laughs> choke them and shake them back and forth and give them like baby shaking syndrome or something. I'd be like, you're so young. Um, because of course, like, you know, you brain your, your frontal lobe isn't even fully formed till you're 25 or whatever and so like feeling shame that you're behind when you're 23 is like so absurd even if you're 40 you know like or even if you're 50 like if you're 50 and you look up the actuarial tables like you have like 35 years of life or something left that's like a long time and so but but people feel shame around this because it's like oh other people are doing better and social media everyone looks so smart and I, I should have done this or it feels like everyone's doing that but in reality like there's no there's no shame you're not doesn't money doesn't make you good or bad it's just a game which is like these numbers that you're trying to improve and and you know figuring out how to like effectively play that game can like help you have a happier life you know like hey don't get a lot of credit card debt going because when you have credit card debt the interest rates are outrageously high and you're going to be 
running the wrong way, like running up a down escalator for the rest of your life, which is like a very like uncomfortable place to be. Um, and so like pay that off and, you know, but it's not, doesn't make you a bad person. The, the mistakes you've made on money don't mean that you're stupid or affect your quality of life. But I think it is important to like, you know, take the emotions out of it and say, okay, this is just a game that I'm going to try to win. And I, I liked your analogy too. Like you can, all these different aspects of it. Hey, like, figure out how to advance your career to increase your income, figure out how to like budget and coupon to reduce your expenses, figure out how to like pick the lowest fee in investments to like grow your money and do all these things that are these little things that don't really take that much time or effort, just a little bit of, of knowledge. And then uh, you'll be better off. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, thank you for that. I, it's just something that, you know, when you, if it's boring, if you think it's boring, it is. If you think it's fun, it is right. Finance or really anything in life, it's exactly what you think it is. So I appreciate you sharing that. And then for our listeners out there, make it fun because that's something that you can exactly do because that's up to your control. Um, so one of my last questions before we get in the, the, the speed fire question, right, which are the most fun, the most easiest is, you know, the future of personal finance club, the future of personal finance, even finance as a whole, what are your thoughts on you know CDB or CBDC as well as the Fed now thing that's rolling in July, right? What do you see personal finance transitioning into? How are you preparing as as a company? Like what what are your thoughts on all that? I mean, with like the banking issues and the potential recession, everything we're facing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think that you know, you guys are young, and so this might be the first time you've like seen bank collapses, but like. In 2000, here's another trivia question for you. And actually, I might not know the exact number to this, but like between 2008 and 2012, how many? So we've had, I think, two like banks fail where the FDIC had to come in and, and make people whole. How many banks failed between 2008 and 2012? You want me to go first on this one, Sean? Yeah. I'll throw another shot in the dark. All right. Um, I'm going to say in the 10,000s. Couldn't have an exact number. Sean? I'm going to say 750. Those are great guesses. And actually, I'm not immediately finding the answer to that. Um, no problem. I think, wait, let me see. I think <laughs> the answer is, I don't know, it's, it's in the hundreds, I think. It's like 500 or something like that. Oh, okay. Um, and so, you know, 11,000 sure is a little high. I just don't even know if there are that many banks in, in the whole in the whole US. Um, but the point is like you can imagine like the headlines that like two made 500 is like bananas. My camera is also dying. <laughs> here. There you go. I know you podcast listeners, you can you can uh edit you can out. listen to your voice way more yeah. eloquently. Um, no, I love it. I, I know when I answer your trivia questions, I'm I'm a little more extreme, but this is all this is all good learning as a whole. Yeah, but the the point is, I think that bad news happens all the time. Like, go back a hundred years. There was like two world wars. There was uh, thirty percent unemployment. There was eighteen percent mortgage rates. There was uh, weapons of mass destruction. There was dot com crashes. There was Black Monday. There was, you know, every year people are saying this is unprecedented times. And and the thing is, like, people don't get rich by like reading these scary news headlines on on the front of, you know, uh, news websites or Twitter or whatever, and and cleverly making moves and be like, oh, I'm gonna like short gold, and I'm gonna buy stock, <laughs> you know, people get rich by focusing on the things that people can control, which is making more money, spending less and investing the difference. Like you can control that. Um, and all the scary headlines, I'm just like, I don't, you know, is, is the, uh, you, the U.S. dollar going to lose world reserve currency? I doubt it. If it is, are do people who own a bunch of stocks and real estate and and have spent less than they made are they going to do better? Yeah, they're going to they're going to do great. You know, they maybe will start getting their uh, dividends and yuans instead of dollars, and <laughs> that will you know whatever. Like, you know, it's just like it's just like people with like their tinfoil hats on are just like so worried about macroeconomic collapse for some reason. Like if the whole economy fully collapses and people can't do commerce anymore like that means you can't go to the grocery store yeah that means a bigger problem amazon trucks are going to stop going gas stations won't you know like you know that's no longer a finance question that's like a prepper question like you need to have shotgun shells and canned goods or something like that um <laughs> yeah. which like i don't know if that's going to happen but like i don't think so but the point is like as long as there's an economy as long as we live in a modern world 
doing the things that you can control is what's is what's best for you. So I don't really like to speculate in the other macroeconomic stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. No, thank you for that. And it's very interesting because I'm very interested. I'm very much a, a all digital kind of guy, right? So there's some debate on Fed now and, uh, you know, just, it's just, we don't need to get into that. But I, I appreciate that, that, you know, uh, a lot of millionaires are made in hard times, right? So this is an opportunity for those who have the knowledge um, or to, to make to make a lot, right? So I, I appreciate you. Sharing. I think that's awesome. Looking forward to it, in my opinion. But nonetheless, um, three ra rapid fire questions, super excited for them. So Number one, right, we are all the way now in April, which is crazy, a fourth of the way through the year. What is one goal, Jeremy, that you are looking forward to execute on this year? A goal. Uh, I'm starting a new company uh, with my, okay. my coworkers at Personal Finance Club in the personal finance advice space to basically make it really easy and accessible to click to, to connect to an expert uh, financial advisor with no uh, ulterior motive, like no product sales and no managing of money um and we're gonna launch that summer and i'm programming again i'm the primary and only uh developer working on it right now um and so we'd love to get that launched and get that going and uh um see if we can make it successful yeah no that's awesome looking forward to that um very cool i appreciate that so you know second question is what is that one book that people have to read whether it's personal finance related uh, you know, personal development related, any, what is that one book that you really need to read? You know? Oh, that's so hard to say one, but <laughs> for young people listening to this podcast, maybe the millionaire next door. I think that probably the worst personal finance habit you can have is, is thinking you should spend money to look rich and that's what rich people do. And it's not, um, rich people, generally don't like to draw much attention to themselves relative to their wealth and um, generally live below their means and live simply and value the things that matter in life, like freedom with your time and, and options and things like that. And buying, um, buying expensive stuff is not the way to, to buy freedom. So I think the millionaire next door is a really great, like, like bring you down to earth perspective on money. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we're a huge advocate for that book. And again, for our listeners out there, Millionaire Next Door, please, if you haven't read it, you need to read it. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. So, you know, the most easiest, fun and amazing question out there for our listeners who very much resonated with you, want to connect with you, want to learn more about you. Uh, where can they find you? That one is easy. Yeah. So the, the brand is called Personal Finance Club and we're most of the magic happens on Instagram at Personal Finance Club, also personalfinanceclub.com. We're on TikTok. YouTube, uh, pretty easy dude to find on the internet. That's awesome. No, this is great. And again, Jeremy, this has been an amazing conversation. I'm so thankful, even with all the technical difficulties on our part, your part, this, you know, that's how you know an episode's fire when things come into play that don't want this fire information to get out of here, right? So we appreciate you. We thank you. And we're looking forward to seeing you uh, at FinCon, right, Sean? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Jeremy, thank you for the time. Thank you for sharing the knowledge. I do have one bonus question for you, too, though. Ooh. If you had to recommend one guest for us to host on this show, who would it be? A guest? Um, I don't know. I'm really big on the Chloe deeper than money train right now. Okay. She's she's really good. Uh, yeah. She's really smart. Every time I listen to her, I think she's I think she has her own podcast, but she also has a book coming out, so maybe she'd be want to be on a podcast. I don't know if other people who do okay. this kind of thing are as readily <laughs> into being on podcasts as I am. But yeah, okay. you can try her. Tell her I said hi. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll see you guys at FinCon for sure. Um, that'll be fun. Your first one. See all the money yeah, nerds in one place. <laughs> absolutely absolutely but again jeremy we thank you so much we appreciate you it's been an amazing podcast again for our listeners personal finance club please tap into it a wealth of knowledge literally um we thank you all if you made it this far this was jeremy schneider from at personal finance club this was on the fly podcast a financial literacy institute podcast we thank you and have a good evening